Have you ever been talking to someone about some sort of a difficulty? Maybe these days uh, the whole subject of coronavirus has come up in conversation and someone says to us, oh, she bless us, there's no, she, there's no, there's no, nothing, nothing we can do now but prayer, nothing left now but prayer. And at, while I think that might even be said with the best of intentions, saying it that way isn't necessarily a good thing. Like there's nothing left, for us, not, nothing left for us now but prayer or nothing we can do now but pray. The, the, the underlying idea behind that is that prayer is your last resort, right? So when nothing else works, pray. You know, when everything else fails, pray. Rather than, prayer should be there from the beginning, you know, guiding every step. So, like, uh, as soon as there's any sort of, uh, an, like, I was going to say, as soon as there's any sort of an issue or prayer, sorry, any sort of an issue or problem, we should be praying. But we should be praying anyway. We should be praying in Thanksgiving. When things are good, we should be praying. Because things are good, thank God. Things are going well. Then things go, take a bit of a dip and we're still praying, you know, for the various issues and problems that are down here. And then things will improve. The coronavirus will pass eventually. And uh, things will, be, will, will, will resume some sort of normality. Uh, and so we'll continue praying in Thanksgiving. So prayer, prayer is constant. Prayer isn't just, oh, bless us, nothing, nothing left now but prayer. Like, we, we pray constantly, or we should be praying constantly, that, 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 that in all things we're thanking the Lord, in all things we're bringing our intentions to the Lord, at all times we are united with the Lord. Our first reading uh, from the letter to the Hebrews, uh, it has this beautiful line uh, just at the end of it there, let us be confident then, in approaching the throne of grace, that we shall have mercy from him and find grace when we are in need of help. Let us be confident. Confident. I'm not sure about yourselves, but uh, I think for, for, for myself, the first time I met people who were confident about their faith, uh, it was a revelation to me. And then when I was in seminary, I came across a book. Uh, it was ba uh, the, the Basics of Apologetics, right? I might have mentioned this before. It was a really badly produced little volume. It was kind of A4, cheap paper. And uh, it started off with, why do we believe in God? <coughs> just the question. I said, just, that's a really good question. Why do we believe in God? And it, then it gave me the answer. I really kind of a confidence, just laid it out there. Oh, we actually have... Good reasons for believing in God. Okay. Why do we believe in sacred scripture? Why do we believe in sacred scripture? So then there it was. There, there were all the answers laid out, all the evidence like. And oh, that's, why, do we have, why do we have a Pope? You know, and the, reading why we have a Pope. Because Jesus established it. Okay. And all these kind of questions. I thought, I'm 21 years of age in the seminary. Why have I never heard the answers to any of these questions? As a 21-year-old, like, you know, so I, I, I've been through three years of college. I had never known there were actual good reasons for believing in God, that there were good reasons for believing in Scripture, that there are good reasons that we believe what we believe, that this isn't just made up. And I, I, it finally started to give me a little confidence in my faith, that this isn't just the mere thought of man, because if it is, thoughts of men change. So how can you be confident in it? Whereas... If this is deeply rooted in who God is, this is God's self-revelation. It's what God says about himself. This is how God leads his church. This is what God gives us. It's his initiative. It's his gift. It's him reaching down to us. It's not us trying to go, well, we have a gap here, so let's fill it in with God. No, it's like this is God reaching down to us, revealing himself. So we can be really quite confident in what the Lord reveals about himself because it is him speaking. Okay, so we can approach the Lord with great confidence. Okay, that, that scripture uh, tells the truth. Now, we really don't have time to go into this. This would, this would be a whole third level uh, series of lectures on uh, apparent biblical contradictions because there are some, like, the Bible isn't straightforward to understand, especially in the Old Testament. There can be a lot of things where you read through and go, what on earth am I supposed to get from that? If you want answers to these and all of those and all similar questions, tune in to Father Mike Schmitz's uh, Bible in a Year program. He's on day 16. Uh, you can catch up. And uh, he'll go through the whole of the Bible with you, and a lot of those questions will be answered. If you're really interested, do that. Uh, I haven't time. 
uh, and he's better than me. Uh, so, uh, how can we have this confidence, not only that God exists, not only reveals himself through scripture, but that he is good, that God is good? And the answer, and what do you think? How do we know that God is good? Very simple question. Jesus and the cross. Okay? So, every time we see a cross, we are reminded of the goodness of God. We are reminded that not only does God exist, but that God is willing to die for me. Right? That God is willing to reach down from heaven to me. That God is willing to take on a human nature and bleed and die in it for love of me. So God is good. Very good. That God is merciful. God is just. And I can be confident. This, this isn't just my opinion. You know, and like maybe the last couple of days people have said, Father, were you getting a small bit snarky the last couple of days? Because I, I, I did use the expression, uh, that's a whole load of rubbish, uh, a couple of times in this week. But like this confidence, this, this isn't my opinion. That's where the confidence comes from. It's not my opinion. This isn't my, this isn't my opinion versus liberals' opinion. This is what God teaches. This is what the church, it is what's, what's part of the church's treasury. And I'm just, I'm passing that on. This isn't my opinion at all. And that's where I can be confident. If I was trying to make this up on the fly as I was going along, eh, then I wouldn't be quite so confident, because maybe I'm wrong. Whereas if, if what I'm teaching is, is what God has revealed, then we can be very confident in it. Which doesn't mean arrogant, by the way. We're just confident. It's the way it is. There you go. I'm very, very confident that 2 plus 2 is 4. The square root of 16 is 4 as well. You know? I'm very confident in that. Uh, it's, it's not my opinion. It's just the way it is. So we can be very confident about how, how God is because he has revealed himself so. And we know that he is good and therefore his word is true. So today's gospel talks about the call of Levi. Levi is Matthew, by the way, so it's the same, same guy, son of Alphaeus, Matthew. And Matthew was a tax collector. And I, it's, it's, it can be difficult for us culturally to understand what's, how this looked, right? Uh, generally speaking, Jews were quite suspicious of any non-Jew, otherwise known as Gentiles, pagans. Like there were, like, you had to, maybe you could trade with them, but you kind of had to keep them at, at arm's distance, right? If you came in from a Gentile conversation, you were talking to some Gentile, you, had to, you know, you had to wash. This was, this was, like, you came in, you had to wash yourself up to the elbow because you'd associate it with pagans, okay? So, like, it, there was a, definitely, a, a distance place there. And also then with sinners, lepers, there was like a lot of people that you couldn't associate with, right? So we see Jesus then, and he's sitting with, uh, just, uh, the scripture's quite blunt, it's Mark here uh, writing, he's quite politically incorrect, but there you go, welcome to the Bible. Um, uh, Mark writes, he was sitting there with tax collectors and sinners. Just sinners, the lot of them, like, as if the scribes and Pharisees weren't sinners, but like sitting there at, at the table with, with tax collectors and sinners. Right. So, and I, I know this is politically incorrect, but there, but there you have it. Um, tax collectors, remember, are collecting taxes for uh, an occupying force. The Holy Land is occupied by the Romans. So the Romans have taken over the land and all the locals are paying taxes to the, to the Romans. So if you're a tax collector, you're working for the occupying force. In Ireland, we know in our history what that would have looked like, okay? I don't need to go into it. Um, but, like, if you're working for an occupying force, like, no one likes you. You're working for the enemy, right? So, Matthew is working for the Romans, effectively. And then not only that, you see, you're working for an occupying force. Chances are, because you're an accountant or tax collector, you can do your sums. You're pretty good at the old two plus twos. Um, whereas the people you're dealing with may not be. So it makes it very, very easy for you to defraud them. They didn't have school. So it makes it just very, very easy to say, oh, yeah, yeah, this is a... So the tax rate of that present now is 13%, right? 13%, whatever that means. Uh, so I'll just measure out now the, the gold here. Yeah, that's 13%. There we go. <laughs> when you've actually taken 15%, 2% for yourself. Like, poor farmer out there hasn't a clue. No offence to him. Like, but he, like, they, didn't, they didn't have schooling, so he didn't stand a chance. So, like, you, you weren't liked because you worked for an occupying force. You weren't liked, generally speaking, because you weren't honest either. Okay, Zacchaeus, another example. Okay, so, and then you've got Jesus sitting with these, like, very unpopular people and sinners. We don't know what the sinners 
issue was, I don't know, were they, were they drunkards? Were they, I don't know, we don't know, we've no idea. Uh, but definitely people of ill repute anyway, by, by all accounts. And Jesus is sitting with them. It would, uh, sometimes we'd love if the Gospels had more detail. I'd love to know what they were talking about. Maybe it's just me, maybe it's just the little eavesdropper in me. But um, like, what were they talking about? So Jesus is sitting at a table and there's a fellow working for the Romans and there's maybe someone who's been unfaithful in marriage <clears throat> and there's someone who's a drunkard and there's someone who's got issues with purity or gambling or who knows what. What were they talking about? <laughs> I'd love to know. I would love to know. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty sure, and maybe this is, just my, this is my opinion. Okay, so this is the thing I can be a little less confident about because this is my opinion. But uh, I don't think Jesus was much into small talk. I think he would have done a small amount of small talk, like just the basic, how are you getting on? How are you? Who? Well, he would have known, but like just to entertain them anyway. He would, <laughs> he would have had to ask them, you know, what's your name, where are you from, just so that they can be involved in the conversation. Um, but like, if you look at the, the woman at the well, Right when Jesus meets the woman at the well, there is a bit of basic, you know, can I have a drink and, and so on and so forth. But then very, very quickly, he gets down to kind of the, 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 the nuts and bolts of, of her life that the man she's living with now isn't actually her husband. Uh, but so there's a certain amount of small talk, but to be honest, he hasn't really got time to be talking about how many cats you have and what color they are. Like, you know, he, he, he wants to talk about real things, serious things, because also, because of his, the limited time in his mission, he hasn't got time to be, to be building up. Like he's going to be moving on, preaching to the next town. Like he's, he's going to be moving. So he doesn't have time to be talking blah, blah. So I would imagine that after the kind of initial introductions and that kind of thing, I would imagine he'd get down fairly quickly to, are you happy? Are you happy? And you're, I mean, just imagine Jesus asking you that, like you're sitting at the table with him. And you're, you're a tax collector, so you know, you're, you're, you're living a, a life in the lap of luxury, or you know, you're engaging in, you're entertaining your vices and all that kind of thing. And then Jesus, Jesus just kind of cuts through it all and says, are you happy? Are you happy? And I could just imagine how that question would just cut right to the core of, of this facade that everyone had put up and all the, the, the sins that they had engaged in. And, and then just the reality would just hit them. I was just, no, I'm not. I'm not like, I'm not. And scribes and Pharisees who consider themselves just. And they did a lot of good things. They would have prayed regularly. They would have tithed. They would have fasted, so on and so forth, you know. A lot of it, maybe, for the glory that they would receive from others, from the esteem they would receive from the onlookers. But they look on in disdain at Jesus associating with sinners and Jesus says it is not the healthy who need the doctor but the sick I did not come to call the virtuous but sinners another reason that we can be very very confident in approaching the Lord he's looking for us first he was looking for you before you started looking for him. So no matter how far you've fallen, you know, no matter how much time you've wasted, no matter what mistakes you have made, we can be absolutely confident that the Lord still wants me, still pursues me, still seeks me, still loves me, that his heart is wide open to forgive me, to immerse me in his mercy. I did not come to call the virtuous but sinners. So dear brothers and sisters, we ask the good Lord to renew our confidence in him, our confidence in prayer. The prayer will not be just a last resort when nothing else works, but that prayer may be constant regardless of whether things are working or not. That we're in prayer in thanksgiving in the good times, in prayer in supplication in the bad times, but we're praying anyway. And that when we feel lost or far from the Lord, that we might confidently reach out to him knowing that he has come to save me, to save the lost, to save sinners. Amen.